What is it about Disney animation that makes those films so compelling? Beyond the storytelling, what is it about the characteristics of the animation itself that convinces us that the Disney style is alive? I think that style often gets mistakenly attributed to the design, exaggerated proportions, soft features, and those big, expressive eyes. But Disney has a wide variety of character styles, and their visual approach changes pretty drastically from film to film. The real Disney style isn't in design, but in technique. Techniques that are universal and style agnostic. Which is why, when budgets were tight, Disney was notorious for repurposing animation from its archive to save time. And they were able to recycle that work between two completely different characters because those techniques are just a framework, a skeleton that can fit within the mold of any design or any process. And that framework was cataloged and published in the 1981 animation bible, The Illusion of Life, written by Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnston. And if you're not familiar with Frank and Ollie, they're two of the nine old men, the best of Disney's animators in the early years of the studio. And they each had their own particular strengths that complemented the rest. Some were incredible draftsmen, others were known for their action, but Frank and Ollie specialized in sincere character expression. And today we're going to take a look at the 12 principles that the two of them standardized in that book, and how they've been utilized by the masters at Disney over the years to make life out of graphite. So if you're looking to explore animating for yourself, or even if you just have a passing interest in the mechanics of the craft, these are the basic tools that make up the groundwork of the discipline. Starting with the first, and probably the most versatile of all the techniques of animation, squash and stretch. The key to creating a convincing organic material is elasticity, and the degree to which it's used can tell you a lot about something's overall weight, mass, or direction of motion. And if a character has a bit of malleability, it's going to keep it from appearing rigid and lifeless. Squashing and stretching the material is a good way to display a more accurate sense of gravity, and a character's flexibility will open the animation up to more expressive and relatable gestures. You can see this technique at work in a character like Lottie from The Princess and the Frog. She's almost entirely made up of several flexible, rounder shapes, and the squash and stretch gives weight and energy to her bouncy movements, while also giving a more naturalistic quality to the animation. It makes the action more readable for the audience by bringing it a bit closer to reality. And achieving a sense of realism is important, but the goal should always be to approximate real-world physics here. So something like squash and stretch is going to be more a feeling than it is a formula. But we are playing with Newton's third law, so remember that it's squash and stretch, not squash or stretch, meaning your object or character needs to retain a consistent mass throughout its motion, up and in, down and out, because every action has an equal and opposite reaction, which is also true of our next principle, anticipation. Anticipation is best described as the preparation for the main action. So again, we're dealing with Newton's third law, the action being the build and the reaction being the release. Frank and Ollie referred to it as broadcasting intent. It's not about waiting for the action to begin, it's the charge that's going to direct it to where it needs to go. It also acts as a signal to the audience to draw their attention to the start of an important motion. Think of it like an elastic band. You're stretching the action back so that it can spring forward. And here's what it looks like without the anticipation. Watch what I can do! If you blinked, you probably missed it. Much like with squash and stretch, anticipation is used to make the action more readable for the audience. In some cases, you can get rid of it to convey speed or surprise, but for the most part, if you want your movements to be believable, they need to be anticipated first. It's all about directing the focus of a viewer's eye, and an important part of directing focus is proper staging. Now, staging is one of the broader principles on this list, but it essentially boils down to clarity in expression and clarity in direction of action the nonverbal communication that comes from contrast, color, camera angles, composition, how your visual elements are arranged in the frame. You don't want a cluttered image with lots of conflicting shapes competing for attention. You want your characters to pop, and their overall form needs to be as distinct and as unambiguous as possible. That's the reason Mickey's ears are always equidistant regardless of the position of his head. You always want a clear, clean, easily understood silhouette, even if that means smudging reality just a little bit. Clarity of intent can usually be at a slightly higher priority than realism. The real important factors are strong compositions, dynamic lines of action, and a consistent visual language. So stick to your geometric shapes, rule of thirds, Fibonacci, all that good stuff. Whatever you can do to draw an audience's focus to where it needs to go. An easy way to do this is to break an image down into its complexity. Straight lines guide the eye quicker, and curves slow them down. So you want your area of attention to be more complex, and then frame those more complex lines with simple lines. The more organized the frame, the more coherent the storytelling can be. And more often than not with Disney films, the frame is the story. Let's look at a simple scene like this, for example. When Nani, Lilo, and Stitch are brought under the protection of the United Galactic Federation, rather than just delivering that exposition through dialogue, the Grand Councilwoman is also shaped into a literal protective barrier around the three of them. Staging is as much a narrative tool as it is an aesthetic one, and if you can represent the whole of an idea in just a line or two, then you have a strong line of action. 
And a strong line of action is important because that's the core of the expression. If you look at some Mickey poses again, here you can see he's jubilant, assertive, frightened, or impatient, and it's all built out of a single line. That's the base of the drawing and the rest is fleshed out around it. So you need a strong foundation if you're gonna sell an emotion through that action. And when we create that action, we can do it in two different ways. And that brings us to straight ahead action and pose to pose. Now, straight ahead action and pose to pose are actually workflow related and not technically principles of the animation itself, but still just as important as the rest because it pertains to the manner in which the motion of a character or object is drawn in sequence. The straight ahead method is more stream of consciousness, drawing each frame one after the other. It's sort of an improvisational approach to animating. And there's a freshness and an energy that comes along with that, but it's gonna be a lot harder to maintain consistency. So not ideal for longer, highly choreographed actions, but it's really useful when animating fluid effects like smoke, fire, or things like this incredible transformation sequence from Cinderella. It'd be impossible to predict the position of those tiny fairy dust particles with the pose to pose method, which is more structured and methodical. So rather than drawing each frame in chronological order, you'll maybe plot out the main beats of the action at frames 1, 29, 52, 67, etc., and then go back through and fill in the meat of the action between the key drawings. So you're losing some of that spark and spontaneity that comes from extemporaneously animating straight through a scene, but pose to pose will keep your proportions, size, and direction more consistent because you have a lot more control seeing it from a bird's eye perspective. But which method you use is solely dependent on the context of the piece. And nine times out of 10, they'll be used in tandem anyway, often on top of each other within the same frame, with things like David's fire dance sequence from Lilo and Stitch. Here, the performance is animated using the pose to pose method along with reference to keep the choreography consistent, and the less predictable elements like the fire and the grass leg ties were animated with the straight ahead method. And if we take a closer look at this scene here, we can see our fifth principle in play, follow through and overlapping action. Anything that's not a part of the core mass of a moving object is gonna move at a different rate. So things like long hair, loose clothing, or hanging accessories are all gonna be playing catch up to the main action. And if the force of that main action abruptly stops, the momentum carried by everything else will follow through swinging past the stopping point before eventually settling. Tarzan's dreads are a great example of this principle at work since they're individually animated locks instead of the solid hairpiece of most long-haired Disney characters. And his wild, hyper-agile acrobatics are pretty implausible, but that accurate sense of gravity displayed by his hair keeps the animation anchored in reality. It also gives a looseness and a fluidity to the motion by emphasizing the direction. With animation, you can usually get away with implausibility as long as the physics of the motion feel organic. And a useful tool for accomplishing that is ease in and ease out. Ease in being the gradual acceleration into a motion from a key pose, and ease out being the gradual deceleration. So what we're really looking at here is spacing, the distance between the individual frames. For this example, we have roughly 15 frames for the in, 15 frames for the out, and 15 frames for the in-between. But notice that the in and the out are a fraction of the length apart compared to the in-betweens, which makes the perceived speed of the ball much quicker in the center and slower on the ends. And without that exponential spacing, you get this, which is called linear spacing. Fewer drawings make the action faster, and more drawings make the action slower. So think of it like a swinging pendulum. More frames in the ends and fewer in the center are gonna soften the action, making it more natural. And just like with anticipation, you can remove it to make the action snappier or to sell a gag. Easing is a great tool for adding some authenticity to your movements, and it works particularly well when paired with our next principle, arcs. So this one's pretty simple. There's one thing you'll very rarely find in nature, and that is a straight line. And what's true of nature is also true of animation. If you want your movements to flow, your visual path needs to follow an arched trajectory. And if we look here at our bouncing ball again, you can see the effect that a forward momentum has on an object in motion. And if we combine that with our ease in and ease out technique, we can get some really smooth, graceful, convincing movement. Let's take a look at this scene with Shere Khan stalking his prey. Watch the path of his head as the sound catches his attention. It moves along a circular path outward from a single anchor point. And you also get a bit of squash and stretch and anticipation in there as well. And that's what keeps it from looking stiff and inorganic. Another way to add some life into a character's movement is through secondary actions. And this is where the animation can really express itself and bring out those idiosyncrasies that individualize a character. Secondary actions are just the layers of supporting gestures that are applied to sweeten the main action. And this is different from our fifth principle in that it's independent action rather than momentum-based motion following through from a primary action. So think of it less as the motions linked to physics, like here with Phil's beard, tail, and hair, and think of it more as the actions linked to attitude, demeanor, and personality. Pinocchio, for instance, has these little nervous tics during his performance. You can see he scratches his leg and twirls his finger in his shorts. It's just revealing a bit more as to what's going on in this character's head. Stitch's ears are another good example of characterization through secondary action because they move independently from the rest of his body and they give us some insight into what emotions he's currently feeling. 
and that's useful since he's not the best at articulating those emotions verbally. You can also gather that information by observing a character's timing, which is our ninth principle. So remember back with ease in and ease out how we talked about spacing being the distance between the frames? Well, timing is just the number of frames themselves, how many individual drawings it takes for an action to be completed, which in turn dictates the speed of that action. More frames means slower, fewer frames means faster. And you have two types of timing, the physical, which is influenced by weight and mass and will give you an idea of the material of the object, and then you have theatrical timing, which is behavioral and influenced by performance. If we look at the seven dwarves, the theatrical timing of their actions reveals a lot about their individual personalities. This scene in the script just reads, each dwarf sticks out their hands. If each of their timing for this action was identical, they'd be pretty indistinguishable outside of their physical traits, which already aren't too distinct. So you'd have a much duller ensemble since you'd be losing what makes those characters so interesting to watch which is those contrasting identities. We're able to get the gist of who these guys are just by their timing and those few exaggerated actions. Which brings us to our next principle, exaggeration. Exaggeration is exactly what it sounds like. You're amplifying an expression to make it more readable. And this can be applied to nearly every other principle on this list to some degree. An exaggerated squash and stretch or arc, for example, could change the weight, speed, and trajectory of your object, or you could exaggerate the anticipation if you wanted to really build up the power behind an action. In animation, a caricature of an action is always going to read better than a direct one-to-one -one replication of that action in reality. That's the paradox of the uncanny valley. The closer you are to absolute realism, the more dull and unconvincing your character becomes. So with animation, you take a different approach. Rather than focusing on those uncapturable finer details, we dial up the intensity of the broader actions, enhancing the emotion, making the expression as large and as clear as necessary. But you have to execute your exaggeration while still being mindful of staying on model and being proportionally and anatomically accurate. And can't have anatomical accuracy without our 11th principle, solid drawing. When Milt Call was asked what makes Disney characters stand out from the competition, he said that Disney characters distinguish themselves from the ones at other studios because they have real bones and muscles. A good animator doesn't think in two dimensions, because animated characters aren't made up of circles, squares, and triangles. When done right, they're made up of spheres, cubes, and pyramids. The reason a character like Megara feels like she has weight and dimension is because she was designed with the form of classical Greek pottery in mind. Solid designs are going to give your characters a sense of tangibility, and that will affect how they can interact with their environment or play off a moving camera. Even subtle garnishes like having light wrap around your character like it would a three-dimensional object is going to lend some credence to the drawing. And with some cases, you're not going to have a completely recognizable anatomy. Take Genie, for example. He's a semi-gaseous, magical shapeshifter. He doesn't have a traditional bone structure but he isn't an amorphous blob. He has very clearly defined proportions when he's in his neutral state, and any changes to that form would be immediately noticeable. Even if a form is exaggerated or squashed and stretched, it still needs to adhere to a solid anatomical structure. And that structure doesn't necessarily have to be completely realistic, but it should be believable. And believability is absolutely necessary in order to achieve our 12th and final principle, appeal. Now, appeal is something that you strive for. So there's some subjectivity there, unlike with the other principles. But it's essentially the culmination of all the other techniques we've discussed today, and how effective they are at creating a fully realized, unquestionably authentic character. Let's take a look at this walk cycle of Pinocchio. You can see there's anticipation in his gait, his arms move in arcs, there's some overlapping motion with his hair and cap feather. You can find nearly every principle at use in something as simple and as rough as this. And all of these qualities working in harmony are gonna determine a character's watchability and attractiveness. And this isn't just limited to perfectly symmetrical, traditionally attractive humanoid characters. Any and everything in animation can be appealing. Because appeal is about more than just a character's appearance. Disney can make a candelabra, a doorknob, or a featureless carpet appealing, because their movements are entertaining and unique and perfectly complementary to their physical traits. And if you can link the characteristics of the movement with the characteristics of the design, then you have an appealing character. In The Illusion of Life, Frank and Ollie put it as simple as this. A live action performer has charisma, and an animated character has appeal. So there you have it. You've had your peek behind the curtain, and now you know everything there is to know about animation. Well, not quite. These are just the first 12 basic principles. Animation at its most stripped down, fundamental elements. And there are dozens of other techniques in play anytime you see an animated piece of art. And the mark of a great animator is knowing when and how to use them effectively, and understanding that animation has all the possibilities of life without any of its limitations. And that's why, even with that peek behind the curtain, even knowing how the sausage is made, examining every line and flip of the page, you're still lost in the mirage. We all are because what you're seeing isn't just the illusion of life. You're seeing the magic of animation.